Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. In today's episode I have something a bit different to the norm. Usually I'd be alone in these sorts of videos, but in today's episode, and following on from the podcast I recorded with James Kibble, the two of us recorded a short video um, speaking about chronographs ranging from the Omega Speedmaster in ceramic through to the, the undoubtedly uh, famous and an incredibly recognisable Rolex Daytona, as well as a few interesting pieces from around the world of the chronograph and the Swiss watch market. So today with James Kibble, the reputable seller from Kibble Watches of used watches in the UK, I bring you five chronographs which may change the way you look at this particular genre. Hello watch enthusiasts, um, we're back with James Kibble um, to speak about a few different watches. Here we have chronographs because um, th this is a, a significant portion of what you sell. You, know, you see a lot of chronographs, they're a popular Definitely. complication. I imagine the most popular complication. Yeah, 100%. Beyond the date. You know, That's so right, yes. And I think, you know, beyond a day and a date, um, you know, a chronograph is one functional, um, aesthetically pleasing, and also, you know, it, it is a complication. So you mm. get something without having to pay for, let's say, a world time or anything, you know, an annual calendar or anything crazy. Mm. Um, and here we have, we have a heck of a selection. We've got things from the madness of the 70s on the left, uh, ceramic, uh, ceramic Speedmaster, um, the Daytona in the middle. Of course, classic. You know, yeah, classic, a watch which um, has been talked about enormously uh, in every way. Of course. Um, an interesting IWC, yes. uh, Portuguese in, in, in gold. 18 karat rose gold, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. And it's, it's a strong colour, you know, it's very different to the yellow gold you might normally see. That's correct. Um, and, and the, the variation in colours between the hands and the dial is fantastic. Um, more of that later on, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, before I get too carried away with that. Uh, and then we have a late 60s Brightling Sprint. That's correct. Which is an interesting one. Um, so what do you see across the board as a, a, a professional dealer yeah, of watches? So, again, we were speaking about it uh, together earlier. This, this is a very uh, good example of value. Now, mm. value is very subjective. Um, there's value in terms of monetary value and whether something can be worth more than its retail equivalent and also potentially be worth more in years to come. Mm. Then there's value in regards to what you get material-wise, which is what I think these two represent. You've got solid 18 karat gold priced mm. very close to what you'd pay for a modern-day um, Submariner mm. uh, pre-owned, which is crazy to think, you know. And I think it's worth noting, especially with something in gold like this, if I just get it into focus, um, and we're, we're not in my studio, I'm afraid, so it's something a bit... Um, something a bit different in terms of um, in terms of showing you in lighting, but I hope you can still see the intricacy of this of the finish in gold is amazing. It's as good as you would see in a harder metal like steel. Yes, one hundred percent. And there's, you know, there's no nothing's been been left out. That's right. And this material. is this is a watch that begs to be seen under macro. Um, mm. You know the the details and the indices and the hands. It's it's absolute perfection. And mm. this is one of those watches where again value comes into play because the movement inside here is not a uh, in house movement. It's not anything mm. too complex. Now, yeah. to some people that is a that's something that's not considered good. Um, whereas for me, you know, I, I believe that's not a bad thing because you're future proofing your watch, and the value for this is what comes in aesthetically. You know, you've got eighteen karat rose gold all at the same price as what you'd pay for a, a Submariner, which is steel mm. dive watch, you know, you've got a beautiful dress watch. Yeah. Um, and it's, 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 it's seriously well made. There's, there's no getting around it. IWC is a, is a famous house for a reason. Yes. Um, the quality exactly. they make is, is great. Um, and as much as we can throw around, as you've said, about the in-house movements and so yeah. on, you can't get around the fact that it's a, it's a brilliant watch. Yeah, and still a brilliant movement, otherwise they wouldn't use it. So you've got you've got that side of value. And again, it's very similar with the dark side mm. of the moon here. Yeah. Um, which are Sorry, it's probably a bit difficult for you to reach around <laughs> uh, reach around the tripod. But if I just get that, if I just hold that there, I'll just get it into focus. Yeah, uh, so the dark side of the moon go. here uses uh, black ceramic, uh, which is a very interesting material. It's very scratch resistant. It is actually hard. Mm. Um, whilst we definitely hear the horror stories of you know people dropping ceramic, I mean, if you drop a steel watch, there's a chance you could break that too. Yeah. Um, so this is a very hard material. It's a very long lasting material. And also the, the intricacies on the dial. You know, we were talking about this watch earlier and we, I, I certainly believe it's a more interesting watch than most of the Speedmasters uh, being produced today. Yeah, it's, and it's something which we perhaps wouldn't see them make again something um, like this with, uh, with a movement which is serviceable because it's a standard movement, but is so, so massively decorated with the surface of the moon. And this is the, the Apollo 8 version. It was released a couple of years ago now. Um, and Apollo 8 saw the, the dark side of the moon for the first time, um, which, is, which is a pretty amazing thing to associate with a Speedmaster and have actually, um, I don't know if it's embossed or engraved. I think it's laser engraved. 
into the surface of the uh, yes, the great. dial the, the to create that, that that sort of effect. Uh, exactly. It's pretty amazing to see. Yeah, it's, it's it's an incredible watch, and again, value wise, it's one of those things where this is subjective value because mm. you're getting a lot of watch for the money. Now, yeah. granted, you pay more than a standard Speedmaster, but unarguably, you get a lot more than a standard Speedmaster. So it's a mm. it's an interesting thing. Yeah, it's. It's um, it's certainly a talking piece. One hundred percent. And I think it's more manageable than the coaxial uh, automatic uh, ceramic yeah. Speedmasters. Yeah, and they're they're very thick. Um, mm. They're very difficult to wear. You know, I've got quite small wrists. I've got for for reference. Um, this is uh, a thirty four mil Amiga, um, and I've got six and three quarter inch wrists. So you can sort of see not the biggest wrists. Mm. So for me, something like even this, this is 44 millimeters, which is two millimeters bigger than the standard Speedmaster. Yeah, it's only one millimeter longer look to look length than the standard Speedmaster. So wearability mm. is still incredibly good, um, which, you know, again, thickness comes into play. It's not very thick because mm. of the standard Speedmaster um, yeah. movement. So yeah. yeah, and the case back doesn't bubble out like on the automatic ones. It's a, it's like a sapphire sandwich That's Speedmaster. Right. It's the same sort of feel you get in the hand or on the wrist. Um, but if we're looking for feel, and a really interesting one to consider is this this Breitling. Yeah, the this, Breitling Sprint. Um, this Breitling Sprint from uh, from the late sixties. The colours um, feel almost seventies actually. That's right. Yeah. So this is a very late sixties, nineteen sixty nine. So right at the end, and the Sprints were this this exact reference two zero one zero to twenty ten mm. um, was made nineteen sixty nine to nineteen seventy. So right at the the start of that crazy era mm. that we'll move on to in the Zenith uh, shortly. But this mm. this offers a lot of value, and the condition of this is everything. So what you'll find with vintage and where value comes into play is condition. So on a modern watch, of course, condition is important, but it's very it's, it's a lot easier to find a good condition modern watch because it probably wasn't made that long ago. Whereas mm. a watch that's made in 1969 to still be in almost impeccable condition, mm. you're going to pay a premium for that. So that's, a, that's again where value comes into play uh, with vintage chronograph. Mm. And, and I think the simplicity of the movements often is, is quite appealing. It's yeah. something very different to what we see today. I mean, even a... a, a, a Supposedly humble, but they're very good movements. Um, Venture 7750. Yeah, yeah, 7750. Um, it's a much more complex movement. That's right. Uh, even you know, Lamani is offerings uh, mm. the 7753. There's there's a lot of options out there in terms of vintage movements that do offer um, a, a very good option at not an awful amount of money. I think what you find with with watches like this, you know, the vintage one, and you touched on it uh, slightly yourself, mm. is the emphasis wasn't on the movement. The emphasis was on the design. It was on the feel. It was on the finish, um, which you know, I feel like we've we've almost gone back um, in terms of watches. You know, it's no longer about that. It's about who can make the craziest movement, and not so much about how wearable is that watch and how enjoyable is it. Yeah, it's it's a different sort of sort of uh, market. And I think before we go to what is, I mean, it's an eighties design, but feels very nineties with the the um, Daytona. But yeah. it's worth talking about the Zenith, of course. And we have to bring up the Zenith, which you see on on the left here. Um, I will lift it up for you. Um, it's a it's a it's a beast of a watch in terms of size. <laughs> Um, and shape, but wearable, amazingly. Yeah, um, so which this I, which is I find staggering. This is very, uh, you know, I, I keep saying it, and I'll always say it with this watch, it's unapologetically 1970s, which is so awesome, especially if you're a fan of 70s design, which which I personally am. So um, this is very much reminiscent of the Zenith Defy or uh, Defi. There's, there's so mm. many people pronounce it all differently. I think it's all a matter of interpretation, yeah, exactly, really. Exactly, and this has the infamous El Primero inside, mm. um, which. Um, as a lot of people know, was used in uh, a Daytona, not this one, but a Daytona. It's uh, been used in many, many watches, and it's an incredible movement. And with something like this, again, you know, condition is everything. Um, but also, the value in something like this is how crazy and funky it is. You're not going to see this on someone else's wrist. You're not going to see anything probably even close to this on anyone else's wrist, um, which is what makes it really attractive. Yeah. And the, then the next piece which we have to talk about is the Daytona in the middle. Of course, yeah. And that, that I mean, the design of that was mid-80s, really. That's right. Yep. I know it's been updated here. The subdials have moved up a little bit That's compared right. to the, the Zenith movement as they went in-house for this particular one um, and to the present day. And the, the, um, there are a few changes to the dial and the case and so on. But the, for the feel, the, the push of that design was yeah. of that time, but it's still a fantastic design today. Yeah, so it's, it really is a great watch. You can see why people like it. You know, when it comes to the dimensions, they're perfect. 40 mm. millimeter case size, you know, it wears so compact on the wrist, and that's thanks to the dial also being only 36 millimeters. Yeah. So everything is drawn inwards. Um, you know, if anything, you could even argue the dial is quite compact, mm. um, maybe a little bit too compact when you look at it comparative to, let's say, the Portuguese, which is, you know, very perfect spacing, it's very aesthetically pleasing. 
Um, so it's an interesting thing with the, the Rolex because that offers something completely different to everything else on the table. Now granted, if you buy things at the right price, you look after them and give it enough time, everything has the opportunity and chance to go above its initial value you paid. That isn't guaranteed, obviously. Um, mm. Whereas with something like the Daytona, it's a, an interesting thing because year upon year we see it growing in value. So that's where value becomes something completely different. This mm. is something that if you bought back then at retail when it came out, this, this model was from 2006, you'd be looking at a hefty and handsome um, return on your investment. Mm. Um, so again, that's a completely different subject of value. Yeah, it's, and this is something which um, you have to consider because it, it might have the perfect dimensions for many people, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the other shapes and sizes. That's right. Because I think that, what is, uh, that one person's perfect dimensions feels too ordinary for someone else. Exactly. And that's perhaps the Zenith buyer here. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's someone who really wants something different. Or even the Speedmaster, it's a different yeah. format, but it wears very well. That's right. It's very comfortable. It just feels different on the wrist. That's exactly it. And you know, as someone who's in the trade and sells these for for a living, you know, this is exactly why I have such an offering like this. There is even more on the website that you can mm. see, but this is like a good representation of what you can get. Um, whether you are looking for the mainstream, the thing that you can potentially put away and look at a handsome return in many years to come, or you're looking for something modern that offers an incredible amount of value uh, comparative to what else you can get, or you're looking for vintage or absolutely mental. For, <laughs> you know, the offering's there and it's there for everyone. Um, and that's the, that's the good thing about this. And a question to ask you is, over, yeah. if you had to wear one of these every day, <laughs> Which would you pick? Zenith. Without with no hesitation. You know, I <laughs> absolutely love this watch. Um, I, I own multiple Zeniths myself. I have a Zenith Defy, which is very similar, just non-chrono. Um, I think this. <laughs> you wear this watch, no one's going to even know what on earth it is, for one, which is a good thing. We wear the Daytona. Mm. There is a, a potential risk involved with such a thing yeah. you know, um, that you do have to consider. With this, I don't believe that's there because no one's going to look at that and think, wow, that's a, that's a Zenith Fel Primera, like, unless they know. Mm. And if they do, they're probably going to be an enthusiast who you actually want to talk to, which is always nice. Yeah. I mean, in my, in my case, it would be between the Zenith and the Speedmaster just because they, they tickle different sort of, yeah. or they, they scratch different itches. 100%. I mean, you could even imagine these in the collection. These, yeah. You know, they, they, they would work so well. Yeah. Because you get the sort of the, the start of the sharp lines in that Zenith, and then you see absolute sharp lines in the Speedmaster. You couldn't get sharper than that, really. No, no exactly. Uh, it is like those ceramic knives you see. It's, it's, it, the edges are they're, they're not so they don't they bother you at all on the wrist. But when you look at them, yes. they catch the light. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see if you look at macro shots on uh, and this is a shameless plug, um, my Instagram page uh, or at Watch Chronicle or on Instagram, you'll be able to see uh, some macros of these watches, and they are amazing. Yes. Um, Whichever one you look at, and all the various other watches which James has so kindly brought with him today um, to show. Now, this, this little bonus feature is very much a bonus feature, but have a look at our podcast together, because it covers a lot of really quite interesting points uh, in the watch world, uh, the watch industry, and how it's moving today, which um, often you, you get uh, shown a very, a very particular view of things. We've tried to give something a bit different, so uh, definitely do yeah. take a look. Um, but I think, I think we'll conclude the, this video there. Um, and thank you very much, James, for being no, here. No, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So um, uh, like, share and subscribe. It helps the channel and, uh, and it allows you to see more in future. So thank you very much for, for watching. This is Armand from watchcrunker.com. Out.